Greetings to my friends and fellow Earthlings, and welcome to Ask an Astrobiologist, the show that celebrates the science and the scientists involved in our quest to understand the nature of life in the cosmos. I'm your host, Graham Lau, also known online as The Cosmobiologist, and we're brought to you by Saganet.org and the NASA Astrobiology Program. Now, I've got to tell you, for all of our longtime fans watching, I'm super jazzed for this episode. It's going to be groovy. Uh, we have Dr. Eddie Sweeterman coming on. We're going to talk about all kinds of things like exoplanets and biosignatures and understanding Earth through time and habitable zones and, and more. So it's going to be super awesome. But we do have some of our fun old housekeeping stuff to do first. For instance, we have our field site challenge that we do every month just before the episode. We release a picture on the Twitter feed for Saganet, uh, at Saganorg, uh, and we ask you where in the world or the universe is this location, and maybe even tell us why it's important to astrobiology. And so the image from this month is popping up right now. It's this really weird strawberry milkshake of a lake. This is Lake Hillier. It's a hypersaline lake. Uh, and Middle Island off the south coast of Western Australia. And that bubblegum pink coloration is caused by a little bit of life. There's an organism called uh, Dunaliala salina. Uh, it's a green uh, unicellular algae that produces a very large amount of pigments inside of its body or inside of its cell. Uh, these organisms can survive very salty environments, up to 35% salt concentrations like hypersaline lakes, uh, like this Lake Hillier. Uh, and they also produce up to something around 10% of their dry mass in beta carotene. And so we've actually used them in cosmetics and other places because they produce so much beta carotene. But it's also important for us understanding how life utilizes pigments, uh, not just for using metabolism, uh, for, for taking energy from a star to, to, to grow, uh, but also to protect the cells from ionizing radiation, from ultraviolet radiation. And so this is a really important area of study for us in astrobiology. Now, this month we, we have our winner was Andre Antunes, who goes by at Extremophiles UK on Twitter. But we also want to give a special shout out this month to Marianne Denton and Victor Baranov for creating a fun little play on words for the Men at Work song, Land Down Under. Now, bear with me here. It comes from a land down under. Where lakes glow and plankton blunder. Can't you hear, can't you hear that thunder? You better run down to Lake Hillier. So I know I'm not a great singer, but you, you guys get the, get the point there. It's pretty awesome. Uh, maybe in the future for Ask an Astrobiologist, we'll create our own soundtrack of song covers with astrobiology lyrics. Uh, who knows? Uh, we also have some awesome ambassadors of the month to share with you. Uh, just like last month, we decided to name four ambassadors this month since so many of you are sharing and retweeting and liking and commenting and engaging and, and getting the word out about our show, about the awesome work the astrobiologists do who come on the show with us. Uh, so this month, we want to celebrate four of you as our ambassadors of the month. Uh, the four of you are Manavika Khanna. Uh, at Manavika K, who I've actually just started talking to through Instagram uh, about her career in astrobiology and, and things that she's really into. Uh, also, Delara Kilkarslin uh, at Dobi Dila. Uh, Delara is a graduate student in South Korea who's been working uh, in, in the realm of astrobiology and is really interested in being involved in that career field. Uh, we also have Azul Pinoba uh, at Azul Pinoba, uh, as well as Esma on Twitter at AstroEsmologist. Uh, Esma is actually uh, just joined me this summer in the Blue Marble Space Young Scientist Program. Uh, she'll be working with me through the Center for Life Detection Sciences at NASA Ames on a project studying biosignatures uh, and how we can use our knowledge of biosignatures to look for life beyond the Earth. Uh, so with all of that said, I'm super excited for this episode. It's going to be a lot of fun, guys. Uh, so please help me welcome to our show, Dr. Eddie Sweeterman. Hi, Eddie. Hi, Graham. Thank you so much for having me here. And thank you to SaganNet and uh, the NASA Astrobiology Institute. Oh, man, it's so great to have you on the show. We wanted to have you on for a long time now to talk about some of your work. You've been prolific of like, publishing so much awesome research in the realm of computational modeling to understand exoplanets, uh, to look for biosignatures, what things might be false positives, uh, false negatives. There's so much cool work you're doing. Uh, and I definitely want to talk about a lot of that with you. Uh, 
Uh, but before we, we get to that point, since we do have a lot of folks who watch the show who are you know, high school students or undergraduate collegiate students, it's always nice for them to hear about the pathways that bring astrobiologists kind of forward in their careers. And I'm curious if you could share with us kind of your, your science origin story, if you will. <laughs> what really got you kind of into this realm of wanting to become a scientist and someone who works in this realm of exoplanets? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Something I think about a lot. Um, you know, my parents were really helpful in cultivating an interest in science with me. Like many kids, I, I love dinosaurs. Uh, my parents bought me dinosaur books, and I, I spent so much time with them. Um, even further than that, my my dad would take my sister and I out fossil hunting, um, and so we dig dig up trilobites and fossilized coral. And I'd spend some time as a kid imagining what those places looked like. You know, hundreds of years ago. Um, and, uh, and, and somewhat, uh, you know, naively, uh, while I had wanted to become a paleontologist, I thought as a kid that by the time I got old enough, uh, that all the dinosaur bones will ha would have been dug, dug up, that all the fossils would have been gone, uh, <laughs> which is not what, not that that won't happen. So if you want to be a paleontologist, uh, don't let that dissuade you. But uh, I, I also got interested in astronomy. I bought my uh, first telescope in high school. I saw the transit of Venus in 2004, and I thought, you know, as that little disk of Venus went across the sun, you know, um, what other civilizations are out there watching their planets, watching our planet transit its sun, you know? And, and that got me thinking about how vast the universe is and how there's so much out there that no matter how many lifetimes you live, you live, there be so much more to explore and so much more to discover. And so that's really what got me interested in, in astronomy. Um, and then I went to the University of Washington in Seattle for graduate school, uh, worked with Dr. Victoria Meadows, who's head of the Virtual Planetary Laboratory. And that's really where I first started um, learning about planetary modeling, planetary atmospheres, professor um, next month at UC Riverside to continue this work on biosignatures uh, and habitability. That's awesome, man. Yeah, and congrats on starting the new assistant professorship. That's that's great. I look forward to all the stuff you're gonna be doing there. Uh, it's really cool to start off with the kind of the, the dinosaur bone kind of you know, background. It's, it's I love that figure where you see it's like knowledge of dinosaurs through time of your life, and like you're a kid, you know everything about dinosaurs, and then you lose it unless you become a paleontologist, and then you get it back again. I think for a lot of us, it's a a huge pathway is because dinosaurs are so cool. Um, but yeah, so for everyone watching, I mean, there's lots of pathways to get into astrobiology. Uh, Dr. Spiderman had a really incredible pathway as well. And now he's going to be a professor uh, sharing his knowledge with other students who are coming up and learning about astrobiology and astronomy and astrophysics. So it's very cool. Um, much like me, you, know, you, you were you know, born at a time when we had no confirmations of any exoplanets. Mm. Um, so, so for you uh, as a scientist, but also just as a person, uh, how, what's it been like for you, someone really interested with a lot of knowledge, as we've been discovering more and more hundreds and now thousands of exoplanets, what's that experience been like for you since that's really what's intriguing you a lot? Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. The first exoplanet around a sun-like star wasn't discovered. 1995. I mean, before then, you know, it was somewhat speculative to think about planets around other stars. But of course, we knew that in our solar system, we had, you know, at the time, nine planets. Now we, we say there are eight planets. Um, and we knew that the processes that happened in our own solar system probably happened elsewhere. And I think this is often, you know, something that, that astrobiologists rely on is this universality of physics and chemistry. And then we hope that there's also a universality of biology, that, you know, chem, that biology is sort of a, a derived chemistry. And therefore, if the same initial conditions happen somewhere else, then we'd expect uh, a, a similar result. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think getting the confirmation that there are, are so many exoplanets out there, you know, is sort of a confirmation of this, you know, Copernican principle that, you know, the Earth while it is a special place to us, maybe isn't the only uh, um, only example of a place that's potentially habitable and maybe inhabited, mm -hmm. um, and that our solar system is full of all these of this of planets, but that there are similar planets elsewhere, and in fact, planets types of planets that we never would have imagined we're discovering. You know, the most common type of planet is actually a planet that's in between the size of the Earth and the size of Neptune. That wasn't expected, um, and so we're learning a lot, um, and we're also sort of uh, discovering that, you know, what we thought might be rare isn't. Uh, on the other hand, we have to humble ourselves in knowing that um, just because we think that or hope that life is common uh, doesn't necessarily mean it's true. We've got to go and look. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no kidding. So so could you, for our audience, maybe explain the process of looking at an exoplanet and specifically looking for biosignatures for signs of life in an exoplanet? 
uh, what does that require? What are we actually looking for or looking at when we're doing that? Right. It's important to remember that right now, uh, at this moment, we're not analyzing exoplanet atmospheres for biosignatures. Uh, we are, we've detected molecules in large planets, planets the size of um, Jupiter and the size of Neptune, in individual gaseous molecules. Uh, Earth size planets are smaller and they're harder to characterize. And so we're really talking about future technology that's within many of our lifetimes, but not right this this second. And what we look for is is um, signs that the environment has been changed by life. And so one example that we often go to on Earth uh, that, that represents huge monumental change in, in our planetary chemistry and our planetary atmosphere from life is the oxygen in our atmosphere that we, we, we breathe, we need it to breathe. And this oxygen came from, in part, photosynthetic life. Without the photosynthetic life, taking carbon dioxide and water and energy from our sun uh, and creating oxygen and, and, and organic matter, that oxygen atmosphere wouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. And so oxygen is one signature, potentially, of life. And the way that we can find it is the way that the oxygen molecule interacts with light. So as light either passes through an atmosphere or is scattered by the atmosphere, uh, certain wavelengths of light are absorbed by that oxygen molecule, and certain ones are, are, are scattered or transmit through the atmosphere. And by looking for that missing light, we can infer the presence of, say, the oxygen molecule. And there are other molecules that are like that. We'd like to see oxygen and perhaps methane, because methane is also produced by life, and together they're in this, what we call, disequilibrium. And that is, if you left them alone, they would react together um, and, and, and the less abundant molecule would disappear. But because both have active sources on Earth due to life, that creates a chemical disequilibrium in the atmosphere. Both interact with light in specific ways that could be inferred from by a remote observer. So that's really what we're talking about when we talk about biosignatures. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, they, they talk a lot, you know, when I, when I have just general conversations about looking at an exoplanet atmosphere for a sign of life, a lot of people bring up oxygen right away. Mm -hmm. uh, but you've also done a lot of work in this issue of like false positives and even false negatives when we're when we start using some of these next generation telescopes to look at these atmospheres. Uh, could you speak for a bit uh, to our audience about what, what false positive signs would be, what false negative signs would be, uh, and how we can best, you know, kind of muddle through figuring that out? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So, um, so oxygen in our atmosphere is almost entirely created by uh, plants and algae and cyanobacteria, so life. Um, but we've got to be really quite sure that the oxygen we find in an exoplanet atmosphere is actually due to that process and not something else. Um, and so one possibility is that there are photochemical processes that generate the generate oxygen. One example that's sort of close to home is Mars. Mars has a very thin CO2 atmosphere. It's cold. It doesn't have a lot of water in it. And those conditions mean that uh, that that CO2 in the atmosphere, some of it gets broken apart into oxygen uh, and carbon monoxide. Some of those oxygen atoms combine into uh, an oxygen molecule. Some of them form ozone. And that's actually remotely detectable on Earth. We can see this, this small amount of ozone and oxygen in Mars' atmosphere. Um, and we wouldn't mistake that necessarily because of all the conditions I mentioned. They're very different from Earth. We necessarily mistake that for life. But it does, but it does uh, tell us that there are processes that can generate oxygen abiotically. And they might be very different um, if the star that the planet's orbiting is very different. And the chemistry is driven in large part by the ultraviolet radiation from the star. So you alter the ultraviolet radiation from the star, um, then you can alter the, the chemical pathways that can generate oxygen from carbon dioxide or ozone from that oxygen and carbon dioxide. And so you've got to be very careful in teasing out those effects. Another example potentially is that you could lose a lot of water. We know that, uh, for example, Venus is an example of a planet close to home, must have lost a lot of water due to its deuterium to hydrogen ratio in the atmosphere. Um, and what happened, what must have happened is the heavier oxygen on Venus, we don't have any free oxygen left except for a tiny amount, like on Mars. Um, but but some have speculated enough water and you have a robust runaway process where you're losing a lot of hydrogen and leaving oxygen behind, that you could oxidize the planet so heavily that, that behind enough oxygen that it builds up in the atmosphere. And that would represent another false positive for oxygen that's not due to biology, but in fact due to an abiotic planetary process. And so we don't know how common that is, but again, we, we have to look um, and our models show that it's plausible. So it's something that we have to worry about. 
And we think about ways to get around that. One of the ways to get around that is to look for this disequilibrium signature that I mentioned. So if you had an abiotic oxygen atmosphere, you would not expect these compounds like methane to be present or nitrous oxide, um, which is another potential gaseous biosignature. So we'd want to look at a combination of things and we want to look at the context of the, of the environment. If we saw 20% oxygen on a one bar atmosphere around a sun-like star, I think that would be a pretty, pretty uh, compelling indicator of life on that planet. You also mentioned false negatives. Um, and so that would be, for example, the half of Earth's history that had no oxygen at all. Um, and so we know that in, 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 the, in the Archean Eon, which lasted from four billion years ago to two and a half billion years ago, there's very little free oxygen in our atmosphere, yet there was microbial life. Um, it was generating methane, but not oxygen. And so um, some have speculated that if we look at or and modeled that if we, we, we look at the methane to carbon dioxide ratio in that atmosphere, that would be indicative of a metabolic process that's taking CO2 and hydrogen and making methane, which very primitive uh, microbial metabolism on Earth do, we believe in the, in the deep geological past. So, so that's kind of a, a flavor of, of this false negative and false positive issue. It's looking, looking at the context. And we need not just astronomers and biologists, but also chemists and geochemists and atmospheric scientists to put all of this together to kind of give us our best shot of recognizing a habitable and inhabited planet. Uh, so, Eddie, uh, this user on Twitter, Rick Ward, at RJWard1775, uh, had asked this really interesting question posting on the, the People of Space Twitter account. He wanted to know, uh, would it be safe to say that the earlier you go in the geological record here on Earth, that the less certain the less certainty you'd have uh, if you were an extraterrestrial species uh, watching us from afar, that there actually is life on this little rock? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Uh, one way to answer that is to think about how much biomass has existed on on Earth, you know, through time. We think the first metabolisms were chemosynthetic. That is, they took an existing uh, energy gradient and then they um, utilized that energy gradient um, for 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 metabolic processes. And that would be very hard to detect remotely and maybe impossible. And then we had photosynthesis that didn't generate oxygen called anoxygenic photosynthesis. And that may have generated um, a, a signature. There's also methanogenesis, which does not require photosynthesis. And so perhaps we could have seen those types of metabolisms on, uh, on, on, on early Earth. Um, but, but it's absolutely true that, that oxygenic photosynthesis, because it generates so much energy and therefore can support so much more biomass, that that would be an easier thing to see remotely um, than than the more primitive metabolisms. Um, but we don't know the extent to which that is true. We think that there are potentially um, uh, atmospheric indicators in the carbon uh, bearing molecules. So if we looked at carbon dioxide and methane and carbon monoxide, um, that, that a primitive metabolism that can do methanogenesis would change the ratios of those gases in such a way as to be uh, uh, inferable that that is a biosignature. Mm, interesting. Yeah, and so it's kind of cool to think about, you know, alien life watching us from afar and how they may or may not have detected us. Uh, I oftentimes have told people that, you know, we're never going to know specifically how life started on Earth. You know, it's just too much unknown there. But wouldn't it be cool if there were aliens out there watching us from afar who had some some knowledge of how it happened here? Uh, uh, Eddie, you have a paper uh, titled A Limited Habitable Zone for Complex Life. And in this paper, you, you discuss the issues with the idea of the habitable zone, uh, the Goldilocks zone, this region around a star where, where liquid water can exist on the surface of a planet. Uh, based on the, the amount of starlight as well that planet is receiving, it turns out that some of these, these habitable zone areas might actually not be habitable. Uh, could you speak to that and tell us, you know, kind of what the interpretation was from, from those results? Yeah, I mean, I think I think so. The habitable zone originally, as a concept, is 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 focused on liquid water, surface liquid water, and uh, a, a prerequisite for life. And I think that you know that's a good um, uh, paradigm for microbial life, for simple for simple life. Um, and you have to think about the habitable zone as how it's as how it's calculated. Often is to assume that the dominant greenhouse gas is CO two. 
And so the closer you are to the star, the less CO2 you need. And the further from the star, the more CO2 you need. And we believe that the process that regulates how much CO2 in the atmosphere is similar to that of the Earth, which is the carbonate silicate cycle. And this is a process that's been posited for the last uh, four, four decades. Earth's habitability through time as the sun has actually started off much dimmer and brighter in geologic time. We believe the CO2 in, the, in our atmosphere started off high and has been drawn down as weathering rates became more robust as the sun got, uh, sun got brighter. Well, if you think about the habitable zone as it exists, if you were to place an Earth-like planet at the outer edge uh, of the habitable zone as it's currently calculated, you would need more than 10,000 times the amount of CO2 that's in our atmosphere today. The CO2 is not just a, a greenhouse gas, it's also a chemically active gas. And we know that from our anthropogenic emissions that the you know, ocean has become acidified. If you're in a room with too much CO2, it can be um, deleterious to you. You, can, you, could, you. you could get CO2 poisoning, it's called hypercapnia, uh, blood acidosis. And it turns out that if you were to place the earth uh, in most of the habitable zone and let it equilibrate to the amount that you would need to maintain above freezing conditions. Um, for most of that zone, humans and most animals on Earth would not be able to survive. Um, and so this is a little bit of a wrinkle um, in, 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 in another dimension to the habitable zone, I, say, I would say. It doesn't necessarily exclude, it doesn't exclude at all the existence of biosignatures or microbial life, but it does make us question about whether the entire habitable zone is suitable for the kinds of bio, the kind of biosphere we find on Earth today. Mm -hmm. That's a good point because I mean there could be could be organisms who survive in those other environments quite well, but just not the kind of the kind of biosphere that we have here right now, right? Well, and, and, and absolutely, and there's a time dimension too, which is really fascinating, because when you look at the habitable zone, uh, in most definitions of the habitable zone, particularly the conservative one, uh, the Earth is at the very inner edge of the habitable zone, and you think that's kind of odd. But if you think about, you know, the distribution of CO2 in the habitable zone, you expect it to be low at the inner edge and, and high at the outer edge. Now, these habitable zones are not static in geologic time. They change as the stars brighten. Stars brighten with time just as our sun has. So the Earth started more, more or less in the middle of the habitable zone, and it's moved inward with time. And what do you know? We find ourselves at the inner edge of the habitable zone today when the CO2, the CO2 problem wouldn't exist. And so it's not necessarily definitive, but it is suggestive that perhaps that isn't a coincidence. Oh, awesome. Yeah, so that, I mean, this is really cool research. Um, I do want to open it up soon to audience questions. And so I think just before we get there, um, if you could, so so one, I, I'd love if you could just tell us, you know, um, what, what tools do you need for your work specifically to do computational modeling? Um, not to mention uh, what tools in the near future um, from computational methods as well as the upcoming telescopes are you most excited about um, to really advance this work forward? Well, well, the tools, I, I, I do a lot of modeling. So I'm using photochemical models, climate models, and radio transfer models. And that allow, allows me to, to, to simulate planetary states um, you know, uh, climate states, uh, chem chemical states for planets. If you say change the star, change the location in the habitable zone um, and things like that, and then simulate the spectral appearance of that planet as they would be observed by future observatories. What really excites me is the prospect of these future observatories. So there are uh, three um, competing observatories that can could potentially characterize terrestrial planet atmospheres in the Astro Astrophysics 2020 decadal. Uh, two of them would be able to image uh, uh, terrestrial temperate planets in the habitable zone of their stars. They're called Hab HabX, the habitable planet, the large optical infrared surveyor. And, um, and then there's also the Origin Space Telescope, which is similar to JWST, but would be more sensitive and would be able to probe uh, the atmospheres of transiting um, uh, planets around uh, M-dwarf stars. And so uh, these, these, these would really be the workhorses in the future for determining the distribution of life in the universe. This would be our, our, our chance to do a survey of multiple habitable zone planets um, um, probe their atmospheres for gaseous biosignatures and perhaps their surfaces as well, and really start to get some robust statistics about how common not just habitable planets are, but maybe even in, in inhabited planets. And they could tell us that life is common. They could tell us that life is rare. Mm. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm looking forward to a lot of these upcoming telescopes. Uh, if there were, you know, some young students right now in high school or undergraduate level uh, who might want to work on the, those missions in the future, if they get funded, if they go into space, 
Uh, what would you recommend to those students to get started right now to get involved in that? Well, I mean, taking taking physics and math is important. Um, if you want to be a, a scientist or an engineer, you can be an engineer and work on the, the this um, on the spacecraft themselves, or you or you could be a scientist and think about how to interpret the observations, plan the observations, um, and uh, and either way, you're going to need a strong quantitative background, uh, so math and physics. Um, and but also expand your horizons and think about the meaning behind this. So 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 don't close yourself only in the STEM classes. Take some art and uh, and and philosophy and 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 writing classes. Communication is incredibly important uh, for scientists. It's one of the most important things we do. We spend most of our time communicating. We just need scientists. We need people who can help us tell the story of what the science is is saying. We need people who are science communicators. And so there's a whole ecosystem that's built around these things. We're interested in finding life beyond us. It's a compelling question. It motivates all, all of us. Um, and you don't need to necessarily be a scientist to be part of that. Yeah, uh, and as a communicator of science myself, I love hearing you say that. Um, so just before I open it up now, finally, to the audience questions, one more thing I want to ask. I do just want to want to know uh, in prepping for this episode, uh, we discovered that you actually enjoy a lot of gaming. And so uh, I'd like to know how you as an astrobiologist studying exoplanets, uh, how you relax. Yes. So um, so as many of us, uh, many of us interested in science um, started off in being interested in games. I, I was interested in, in civilization. I played many hours as a teenager of, of, of civilization. Um, now, I don't have a lot of time for gaming, but when I do, I play a game called Stellaris, which is about exploring a galaxy and making scientific discoveries and uh, ex expanding. It's a 4X game. Um, and uh, what I like about it is you can pause it and start it you know, um, according to your own schedule. Um, so that's one of the games that I play. Um, other things to relax, I like reading. As, as, as a teenager, a lot of the Asimov uh, magazine, uh, Analog. Um, I enjoy uh, novels by uh, uh, Arthur C. Clarke and uh, Asimov and David Brin, um, some of the authors. That's awesome. Yeah. So, you know, all of us in the sciences and engineering and other realms like this, we also all have these other pursuits that kind of, you know, fill in our lives. Um, so I'm going to open it now to the audience questions. Uh, and thank you to our audience for, for bearing with us here. Technical glitches we've had along the way. Uh, just remember, you can ask your questions on Twitter using hashtag AskAstroBio in the SegaNet chat or on the Facebook page for NASA Astrobiology uh, if you're watching there as well. So, Eddie, the very first question uh, comes from Dr. Jim Pass uh, of the Astrosociology Research Institute. Uh, and Dr. Pass wants to, wants to know, since he's a social scientist himself, what your thoughts are about the types of techno signatures you would favor in the search for extraterrestrial societies. Um, and if you could maybe mention the relationship uh, and differences between biosignatures and techno signatures as well. And I, I use the word biosignature to mean non-technological life. So, so evidence of um, uh, analogs to bacteria or algae or 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 um, you know plants, um, and 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 they can affect their planet in in, in drastic ways as we see on our own as, uh, on Earth. Uh, but a techno signature would be specifically an indication of a technologically advanced civilization. And so you could think of a techno signature as perhaps. In a, in a broad sense, a radio wave that's generated by a transmitter, uh, by a uh, laser a flash, by a structure perhaps that could only be made artificially by um, even a certain kind of molecule in an exoplanet atmosphere that can only be created through industrial processes. Um, so that would be those would be examples of techno signatures. And so which ones do I favor? Well, I think the advantage to biosignatures is that in the future we can we can do a volume limited survey. We can look probe the atmospheres of planets that are in the solar neighborhood, and we can look for um, for 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 oxygen, for methane, for nitrous oxide, and we can say yes or no. Those are present in detectable quantities. Um, for techno signatures, I think we we have we we have an advantage in the sense that 
potentially, if you have a strong enough transmitter, you could you could find a, a sign of intelligence from a much larger distance away. Um, so instead of tens of light years, maybe hundreds or thousands of light years away, uh, if it exists. And the problem, of course, is that you can't do a volume limited survey. And so you can't necessarily set a lower limit on the prevalence of these techno signatures that are out there. But I do favor the idea of, of looking for them because we don't know uh, until we look. And, and, and there's, a, there's assumptions, uh, people have assumptions about whether life is rare or common and assumptions about whether civilizations are common or rare. And the only way that we can be uh, sure is to actually make the observations and to make the effort to find them. Mm. Um, and so I'd say that, that, that biosignatures and technosignatures are complementary in this way, that we can do this volume limited survey in the future for biosignatures, and we can kind of look at much larger distances uh, for for techno signatures um, that may be more m more detectable and more obvious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, so our next question comes from Anurup Mahanti uh, at Strayologist on Twitter. Uh, Anurup wants to know. Um, so in in this realm of talking about exoplanet atmospheres, and we're talking a lot about you know the, the Goldilocks zone, the habitable zone. Um, and and Anurup wants to know if you think that we're missing out on a lot of potentially uh, habitable extrasolar bodies. Um, because of things like, you know, in, in our solar system, we have these icy worlds in the outer solar system that might have life and oceans. Um, are we missing out on, on, on ways of looking for those kinds of life as well? Well, I think this speaks to the complementarity of the search for life within the solar system and, and the search for life outside our solar system. And so the reason why we're looking for planets in the habitable zone, um, you know, so-called habitable zone and exoplanets, is the idea that you have this interface between the ocean or the land and the atmosphere. So you have a way for biosignature gases, for example, to mix into the atmosphere and then create a signal that can be detected remotely. And, and, and that's robust enough to be detected over interstellar distances. If the life is under an ice shell, that's much more difficult, if, if not impossible to detect remotely. However, we do have these examples of potentially habitable environments within our solar system. And we could send in situ um, uh, probes to, to sample those environments. Um, and so that could tell us if, if we find life on Europa and Enceladus that icy moons are very common habitats um, and, and in, the, in the universe in general. Um, but right now, there's no way to, to, to look for them if they're in, outside our solar system. So it's really a matter of practicality. We're not saying with the concept of the habitable zone that there are no habitable environments outside the habitable zone. What we're saying is those are the places we have the best chance of detecting uh, planetary biosphere remotely. Mm. That's awesome. Yeah. So, so Anurup actually kind of has a follow-up question then too, kind of going on that. Um, so you, you know, you're, you're working a lot in computational modeling of the biosignatures that we're, we're going to be looking for very soon with the next generation of telescopes um, and may potentially find. Uh, Anurup wants to know, uh, can we expect to see techniques being developed to analyze exoplanet subsurfaces in the near future? Uh, I, I would say that that what we need is a way to translate what's happening in the subsurface to the atmosphere. And so if there's an exchange of gases from the subsurface to the atmosphere that creates a disequilibrium, that's something that could potentially be looked for. But what we need is the 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 composition of the atmosphere to have changed in a way that's finger, that, that can fingerprint life for uh, and for those gases to be abundant enough to be detected over interstellar distances. Mm, OK. Uh, so we have another question here. Uh, so a lot of folks uh, might have noticed uh, yesterday, uh, they might have heard some news that a new paper came out suggesting that there's some 30-ish planets uh, in our Milky Way that, uh, that likely have life. Uh, we have a question from the rebel educator, uh, uh, Doctor of Education, on Twitter at Dr. Andrew Kemp. Uh, Dr. Kemp wants to know, uh, with the news that there are a potential 36 planets with life similar to ours, would it make sense that some of these would be vastly more developed than we are? If so, is it logical that they know about us? Well, uh, so so this this is a, a, a paper that I admittedly have not had a chance to read yet. So I'll, I'll speak more generally about about the Drake equation and about the search for um, extraterrestrial intelligence. And so the Drake equation is a way of 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 kind of parameterizing our ignorance about how many uh, civilizations are in are, are in the are in the uh, galaxy. And so you take the number of stars times the fraction of those that have um, planets times the fraction of those planets that could develop 
um, that are habitable times the fraction of those habitable environments that actually develop life and then so on and so forth. The end is how long um, the civilization lasts on that planet. And so that's a really key thing to consider is that I believe that in many of these assumptions, we assume that that last number is, is comparable to the to the um, current longevity of our technical civilization. And so that's kind of a built in assumption that they're similar to us. But I do want to jump off of that, because if you think about how old the universe is and, and how old our galaxy is, you can leverage something called the cosmic calendar, which is collapsing the whole history of of the universe down to one year. And to illustrate that, um, the sun only formed four months ago in this timeline. Dinosaurs roamed the Earth on December 25th. Humanity developed, developed eight minutes ago, and the average human lifespan is 0.2 seconds in this cosmic year. And so if you imagine a civilization that arose just a minute before ours, uh, uh, 10 minutes a day, it would be incomprehensibly beyond us. When you consider the fact that the 10,000 years between the invention of agriculture and our current time is just this, you know, um, uh, less than a less than a minute. It's about it's about 25 seconds in this cosmic timeline. So I would imagine that if we did find an extraterrestrial civilization, the chances of us finding one that's comparable to us is is zero. They're probably far ahead. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and you know, it's always compelling to think about you know time in that way that you know we really have been around for a very short time, a blip in cosmic time. Uh, and I also will recommend for for our audience watching, uh, the website Information is Beautiful has a really cool Drake equation uh, interactive graphic that you can play with and change those numbers and kind of give yourself an idea of what happens when you start actually moving those numbers around. So uh, I highly recommend. That. Um, our next question for you, Eddie, comes from Gaurav Yadav on Facebook. Uh, Gaurav asks, uh, which instruments are used to detect and study these biosignatures? Um, and then kind of following on, and this might be more specific to our solar system for now, uh, is there any way to miniaturize like mass spectroscopy that we could put on a spaceship and then, and then detect biosignatures? Yeah, okay, so I'll do the first one. Um, so there, there are many different technologies that have been proposed to uh, to detect the atmosphere and, and potentially probe the services of Earth-sized exoplanets. And so the challenge here um, is, is multifold, multifold. So the Earth is out, outshone by the sun by a factor of 10 billion. So that's 10 to the 10. And so you, would, you need the technology, if you want to directly image the planet, to null out the starlight from that star and reveal the starlight of the planet, or the, the, reflected, the reflected light from the planet. And there are a couple of ways to do that. One is called a coronagraph, and the other is called a star shade. The coronagraph is internal to the telescope, and we have um, examples of these already. Um, the, the challenge is getting to this level of one part in 10 billion. Um, and so currently NASA is st studying both coronagraphs and star shade. Star shade is an external occulter that would be a separate spacecraft that would have petals that are shaped um, in just the right way to null out the light from the star and reveal the light of the planet. And and there are current tests going on that are getting very close to this 10 to the negative 10 uh, starlight suppression level. And so they will be able to reveal the planet. And then it's just a matter of using a spectrograph to, to break up the light from the planet and reveal uh, the molecular composition of the atmosphere. That's one way of doing it. There's also the way of doing it where you where you look at the light filtered to the planet as it's transiting. And again, what you have to do is you have to subtract off the light from the star and and reveal the light from the planet and and the light from and that light reveals the molecular composition of the atmosphere. And so we have done that already for large, large planets, gaseous planets. Mm -hmm. yeah, whenever I think about, I mean, just the, the very thought that we are capturing that little itty bitty amount of starlight coming just through that small veneer of atmosphere around a planet. And then it, we're able to actually subtract that from the starlight and actually do some, some chemical, uh, some chemistry with it and actually understand it is just, it's almost, it's almost shocking. <laughs> it's, it's a, it's, it's, it's quite a fine measurement, you know? So, um, so the earth transiting the sun is one part in 10,000 and that's the whole planet. And then we talk about the atmosphere, you're talking about parts, parts per million. 
Wow. Yeah. It's, it's so small. And I, I hope people just, you know, spend some time just thinking about, you know, how far we've come and trying to understand this and, and how far we can go yet in the future uh, and doing more there. Uh, I actually want to jump out uh, uh, just for a second and ask if you've heard of this recent idea um, of sending a series of, of uh, telescopes uh, far from our sun um, and then kind of looking back and using the sun as its own gravitational lens uh, to actually look at exoplanets from far away um, to maybe, you know, and this wouldn't happen anytime soon. It would take a, a very long time to build this, but we could build an array of gravitational lensing telescopes to actually look at the surface of an exoplanet. I'm not sure if you've heard of this this project or not. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And if you could speak to it for a moment. Yeah. So, so the the idea is that you'd use the the the, gra the gravitational um, uh, the sun as a gravitational lens and amplify the signal from a distant planet, and you'd have to go to the the focus of the sun, which is about a hundred AU away, 100 astronomical units, so 100 times the distance between Earth and the sun. And it would be quite a challenging proposition to put a telescope there, but it would be a lot less challenging than actually trying to uh, undertake interstellar flight. Um, and and also it would be much, much, much quicker. And so this is something probably probably in the far, what we think of as the far future, but not nearly as far as say, uh, sending sending an interstellar spacecraft uh, to a neighboring star. So I think it's 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 a really fun idea um, to, to, to pick apart and think about. And I think ultimately this is how the science is going to progress is that we are going to sort of start, start a survey of, of, of our solar neighborhood for planets that we believe, um, are, are, are potentially habitable. And we're going to learn more and more about those worlds as time goes on. And once we find them, and once we find the first putative biosignature, you know, we're never going to forget about those plants. We're always going to go back and refine our understanding of those worlds. And it's going to last um, for for as long as we last as a species. Mm, that's awesome. Um, so kind of uh, in that realm then, um, I want to go to a question from Anarup as well uh, from Twitter, um, who wants to know about the significance of having the James Webb Space Telescope when that launches, um, go out to a position known as L2, go, go out just past the moon um, and orbit out there um, compared to something like Hubble that or orbits the Earth. Yeah, I mean, so the James Webb Space Telescope is exciting. It's going to do a lot of general astrophysics, um, not just uh, exoplanets. Um, but it has the capacity potentially to probe some rocky exoplanetary atmospheres. Maybe if we get lucky, we'll detect things like um, carbon dioxide in an exoplanetary atmosphere, find the first secondary outgassed atmospheres, um, and, and just begin with a very small number of targets to, to perhaps constrain habitability on some. Um, but it is, it is limited in some ways. Uh, but the reason why we why we want to put it out out at L2 is is in part to um, to, to make sure it's cold, uh, in part to avoid um, um, the light from Earth <laughs> um, interfering with the observations. It does mean that there are a lot of consumables on 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 the spacecraft, and therefore uh, its lifetime is probably is, is is much more limited than that of Hubble. Mm, okay. Yeah, because with Hubble we could actually work on it in orbit. Um, still looking forward to JWST, though. It should be a very awesome mission. Um, okay, well, we have another question. We have another question here from Twitter from Avani Hedge. Uh, Avani wants to know, um, and this is interesting, is it an advantage or a disadvantage for us to understand the diversity of life on Earth when we're in this quest to understand or, or to find life elsewhere? I, I have to think it's an advantage. You know, we... we you know, we, we are limited um, by the fact that we, we likely have one origin of life to work with in our solar system as the origin on, on Earth. Perhaps we have other origins in the future um, when we probe the subsurface of Mars or the subsurface of Europa or Enceladus. Um, but for now, we have one origin of life and we have all the permutations that life has taken. Um, but there is a concept called con convergent evolution um, that's existent, exists in multiple clades that are relatively unrelated on Earth, although they do share common origin. Um, they independently evolve the same either metabolism or the same um, adaptation, the same morphology to meet the same problem. And so understanding the diversity of life on Earth does give us a huge amount of information about the possibilities for life elsewhere because we do believe physical and chemical conditions um, that existed on early Earth will exist elsewhere elsewhere in, in, in our universe. Yeah. And it seems like, you know, convergent evolution should lead to some similar things if there is life out there. 
Um, but maybe not exactly, you know, what we see in movies, right? With, with two arms, two legs, you know, two eyes, that kind of thing. But maybe arms or fins or wings are common um, for some organisms. Um, we have a question from Austin Diang on Facebook. Uh, Austin wants to know, uh, what methods do we do we have to distinguish biosignatures that are not abiotically produced? Yeah, so um, so one is one is to fingerprint the abiotic process. Um, so so if we think that it's from say photochemistry, the breaking apart of say the CO two molecule into oxygen and carbon monoxide, we'd expect there to be a lot of carbon monoxide alongside that abiotic oxygen. So that's one idea that you could fingerprint the abiotic process. Another idea is that if you have a massive oxygen atmosphere from this runaway process I mentioned earlier, where the hydrogen all escapes and the oxygen is left behind, you probably would end up actually with a lot more oxygen, if you were left with any, than um, than exists on Earth today. And and oxygen has these um, uh, molecular features that uh, only are only strong when 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 the oxygen abundance is very high because they're due to collisions between oxygen molecules. Um, so that's one way is to fingerprint the abiotic process. Another way is to look for the disequilibrium, as I mentioned, so that uh, you would not expect the co-occurrence of certain gases together. The fact that Earth today has oxygen, ozone, yes, but also methane and nitrous oxide is indicative of this non-equilibrium process that's driving, that's life, that's driving the disequilibrium between the gases. Additionally, we have something called the vegetation red edge on, on Earth, which is this um, contrast between a chlorophyll absorption at, at visible wavelengths and very reflective um, vegetation at near infrared wavelengths. It's used. This effect is used to map vegetation on Earth. It exists uh, in the disk average of our planet to some extent, and it's another tool in the toolbox potentially for fingerprinting biospheres on other planets. We don't necessarily expect that to be the same on 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 other planets, but it could be. Uh, there could be a, 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 a similar signature where you have this spectral break between absorption and reflection um, that indicates a biological pigment. Um, and so, what we really want to see is this multiple lines of evidence that converge on uh, the biosignature interpretation. So we rule out the abiotic processes, and then we rule in the biology by looking for the disequilibrium. Mm. Uh, and, and on that, so, you know, we started off the, this episode with that image of, of Lake Hillier being that bubblegum pink coloration from this organism that produces uh, carotenoids, you know, they, these, these pigments. Uh, I wonder, you know, just for fun, do you think we're going to we're going to see out there in the cosmos a bunch of planets that have like weird colorations to them because of an abundance of organisms producing pigments like that? Yeah, I mean that's one one possibility is that there are pigments that are that are it's not just you know green chlorophyll pigments that are out there, um, and so the there's there's the denoniella algae that produce the carotenoid pigments, and then there are also archaea that have pigments like bacteria rubarin uh, and, um, and, uh, and 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 rhodopsins. Rhodopsins are kind of pigment uh, that generates energy from from the sun but it's not a chlorophyll so it's uh, driving the production of energy by creating this proton gradient that then drives the production of atp which is the energy currency of a cell right now we don't know of any organism that uses this rhodopsin pigment to fix carbon but it can make energy and so you might imagine that there are other organisms out there in the universe that are using similar pigments to generate energy and perhaps they'll have a spectral impact on their planet be so cool to find a pink world <laughs> or a purple world or, a, you know, other colorations besides our little blue marble. Um, we have a question from Satyam Tiwari uh, on SaganNet. Uh, and this kind of goes back to what we were discussing, you know, with, with conditions of life here on Earth and this idea of convergent evolution leading to some things that are similar but also being different. Uh, Satyam wants to know, well, would life on exoplanets evolve in similar conditions or chemistries as we find on Earth today? Well, yes. Yeah, so, so the the Earth today has a wide variety of environments, and so this speaks speaks to one of the pre previous questions that we have. We have environments that are low in pH, that are high in pH, so acid and alkaline, and and high in salt and low in salt, and high in temperature and low in temperature, and so we have this huge menu of environments on Earth that life is adapted to. And we believe that that diversity is going to be recapitulated on exoplanets, that there will be a wide diversity of environments and niches for, for life. Um, and so studying these environments is really critical, both to understanding the history of life on Earth, 
where certain niche environments today might have actually dominated in the past to extrapolating those to to other planets um, where, where again, the conditions may be more similar to uh, what are niche conditions today or what are more similar to ancient con conditions in Earth's ancient past. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Uh, I, I do want to, so we are getting close to the hour now. Uh, uh, thank, thank you to everyone who asked questions. I am going to pick one of the questions that remains yet uh, as my favorite one to ask. Uh, this one comes from my co-host, uh, Sanjoy. Uh, on SaganNet, Sanjoy wants to know, uh, Dr. Sriderman, how do you balance the demands of science with raising a young family? Uh, right. The great question, uh, Sandra. Yes, I have, I have two sons. Um, one, one was just born last month <laughs> and one is two and a half years old. Um, and, and, uh, an intelligent and, and lovely partner. And so, um, and so, yeah, I think, I think it's in, in, incredibly important to prioritize your family. Um, um, I, I love spending time with my kids and playing with my kids and, and they'll always, uh, always come first for me. Um, but I think I see, I see as kind of, kind of my responsibility to instill the wonder in my kids that I feel for my science and that also my parents help me with. Um, and we are all kind of this continuation. We're all part of the same universe. And so understanding that um, and helping my kids understand that in the future is really important to me, um, that we can all share in this beautiful universe that we live in where we can think about finding life elsewhere. And, and, I, and, 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 and this is all to say that everything is related. You know, if you have to bring um, compassion and love into your job and, in, and into raising your, your family. No, it's beautiful. Uh, Eddie, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's been great having you on the show. Uh, for everyone watching, uh, here's a little call for act to action for all of you. Uh, so with upcoming missions now for looking for signs of life in our solar system, uh, as well as some of these upcoming next generation telescopes that, that Dr. Sweeterman mentioned during our episode, uh, do you think we're most likely going to find life on a world in our solar system or from an exoplanet first? Uh, and if you have any thoughts on that, feel free to discuss amongst yourselves, or you can find us uh, at Saganorg, at NASA Astrobio, at No Green Stars, at Cosmobiologist, and use hashtag Ask Astrobio on Twitter. Uh, get involved in the conversation. We'd love to have more uh, conversations with you. Uh, Eddie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Graham. It was great to be here. And for everyone watching, uh, uh, right now Mike's going to bring up onto uh, – the, the, the display for you to see uh, how to subscribe to the email list for NASA Astrobiology uh, to loop into upcoming episodes and more info. Um, and so you can see that right now. Uh, and then, you know, to all of you, thank you for joining. And as always, remember, stay curious.